we are back. Golenbach University. I'm Ralph Tycho of the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. One of the three baseball Meshuganers, Alan Blumkin, Meshugana number two. Um, how are you? Okay. All right. And uh, <laughs> um, restrained enthusiasm, as uh, curb your enthusiasm, as Larry David would say. Uh, Peter Golenbach, professor, how are you? Just fine. Happy Father's Day, sir. Um, Thank you. I'm just curious, do you guys watch Curb, Curb Your Enthusiasm? Um, oh, as, often, as often as possible. Uh, it's the funniest thing. <laughs> My God. <laughs> I watch the outtakes on on YouTube. Um, it is absolutely terrific. And I think I may have a surprise for both of you. Um, one of my uh, old comedy buddies, Ed Krasnick, is, wrote, uh, I don't know if he still does, but uh, he was in the original Curb Your Enthusiasm documentary. He wrote, uh, he's a writer for the show. And I know that Larry David is an incredible Yankee fan. And uh, I'm going to try to get Ed, who's been uh, a guest on my airwaves, uh, Ed Krasnick, um, to bring Larry on and um, talk to you, Peter Kolombach, and to you, Al, Al Blumkin. How are you doing? O- other than... That um, how's New York weather? Al? Hot and humid. As hot and humid hasn't yeah, let up at hot, all. Huh? Uh, yeah, relatively hot. The, the the week was very erratic. We had a couple of days of ninety, and then a couple of days of sixty. A lot of rain, uh, and uh, but it's uh, you know it, it's, it's it's very very up and down, but it seems to be steadying. Uh, that they're forecasting highs in the low eighties for the week. Right. Ralph, let um, me jump on something. Let me jump on something you just said because I, I would hate for this to, to go zipping by on how much Larry David is a Yankee fan. Uh, of course, people know that Larry David, along with Jerry Seinfeld, were the two people for the most part who were responsible for the show Seinfeld. And they also know on Seinfeld, one of the main characters in the last few years of the Seinfeld show was George Steinbrenner. And the person right. who impersonated George Steinbrenner was Larry David. And, um, you know, when I did my book, George, which, which was a, a biography of George Steinbrenner, I was curious as to how um, uh, Seinfeld and, and Larry David were able to get Steinbrenner to agree uh, that they, they should, you know, uh, spoof him on the Seinfeld show. So so I called a friend of mine who worked in the Yankee front office during that time, and he told me basically that Seinfeld had called Steinbrenner on the phone, told him what he wanted to do, and asked for permission to, to um, you know, use him as a character. Steinbrenner had no idea who Jerry Seinfeld was, not a clue. The show had been a huge success for like five, six years, Steinbrenner had no idea who this guy was. So he goes home, and he says to his grandkids, I just got this call from some guy. His name is Jerry Seinfeld. I don't know who the hell he is. And the kids, of course, went crazy. And he said, well, you know, Jerry wants me to be a character on his show. And the kids said, oh, you know, Grandpa, you got to do it. It's a great show. you got to do it. And so... George Steinbrenner said, okay, having no idea just how badly he was going to be lampooned on that show. And oh, I don't some think of he the knew. Greatest, I, don't, I yeah. really don't think George Steinbrenner looked at it as being uh, – uh, people like that don't look inwardly. Well, I mean, they, the thing that I discovered, the thing I discovered is that George Steinbrenner and Donald Trump could have been twins. So you talk about two of the absolute most narcissistic personalities in the whole world. Uh, just as Trump, George Steinbrenner had 
uh, primary goal in life, and that was to be in the newspaper headlines every single day. That was his goal. And so the idea that he was going to be on television, regardless of how they were going to treat him, just appealed to him to no end. And and the the marvelous thing about how Larry David and, Stein, and, and Seinfeld handled it is they actually had somebody inside the Yankee uh, organization who was feeding him things about Steinbrenner's personality. And so eating for instance, habits with the cannolis and eating stuff habits, like eating habits, the fact that he ate the exact same thing for lunch every single day, they knew that. So they had this this this, this fabulous fabulous episode where they were supposed to bring him a calzone every day for lunch. Steinbrenner had a calzone. And what was marvelous about this is on this particular day, George could not bring him the calzone for one reason or another. So he went to Newman, who's the post office, you know, the postman. And Newman <laughs> promised to bring him the calzone. So what was Jerry so Hallude. utterly hysterical, hysterical about this episode is on this particular day it rained. And because it rained, Newman who was a postman, couldn't bring him the calzone. You know, you've got the expl explanation of the, the slogan, whether it's rain or sleet or snow and so forth. No, nothing stops the rounds of the postman, except when it comes to Newman. <laughs> and so, well, you know, so you, you have... You hit on something. They're fa Trump and Steinbrenner are exactly the same. And it's Father's Day. We're going to talk about fathers affecting their kids. Trump's father was a slumlord for Woody Guthrie back in the, in the days. Mm -hmm. um, Steinbrenner's father, you know more about Steinbrenner's father and their relationship than anybody on earth, Peter. So, That's um, probably true. Well, That's what, true. But before uh, we get to their, before we get to their, before we get to their relationship, I want to go back to the Steinbrenner uh, character on the Seinfeld show because meantime, truly yeah. one of the great, 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 great moments in all of television comes when on this particular day, George is missing from Yankee Stadium. For whatever reason, George George's car was not there. George was missing. And George Steinbrenner decided that George Casanza must be dead. So... <laughs> He drives over to the parents, to George Costanza's parents' house, and knocks on the door and gives them the bad news that your son is missing and he's probably dead. And, and of course, the great line of all time, Costanza's father screams at him, why did you trade Jay Buner? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the take, 20 the years, mother's take, 20, the mother's oh. take is wonderful. She looks over, George is dead. <laughs> <laughs> it is, I mean, only Larry David, only Larry David could oh, come up with something is, as crazy, crazy, crazy as all of that. That was just, what an absolute comic genius. And, right, uh, an absolute comic genius. Also, with the Yankees, they had an employee whose goal was always to be the first Yankee employee in the office for the day. That's what this guy decided. This was going to be his way of climbing the <laughs> ladder of the Yankee organization. <laughs> and from that little kernel of information, Larry David came up with the idea that George Costanza would have a carpenter build under his desk a platform for a bed so that he could sleep. He could sleep under his desk at night. That's so that he would be the first one in the office in the morning. I mean, it's just so cockamamie. George was so cockamamie, and Larry David showed just how cockamamie he was. It was just Utter, utter, well, utter, utter, what utter, I admired utter. is the roundtable meetings with all these guys sucking up to Steinbrenner and <laughs> trying to get ahead of each other in every I, way. Like I did with Trump last week. That's right. That's yeah. exactly right. You know, oh, I, compared, I compared that, uh, what the Trump, the Trump thing last week, I compared it to a, uh, 
Politburo meeting in the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin. Truly, truly so. No, no, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I, in a way, and I'm, I'm changing over from Seinfeld to politics, in a way we're very lucky that Trump is the president and not somebody like either Pence or somebody like uh, Paul Ryan. Because it's Ryan, possible. Absolutely. I'd like to punch yeah, Paul it, Ryan in the face. Yeah. yeah, you would, but the, oh, the yeah. fact is those two guys might actually accomplish something, hmm. and they're they're smart enough and, and sneaky enough, and they still might, but with Trump as president, they might not, hmm. and so the one chance that this country has of not going straight into the toilet is, is, is Trump uh, being so enmeshed with all of this, um, uh, all of this legal business of his. That well, maybe. they're coupling Pence to the investigation in Russia now. He, oh, good. he lawyered oh, up. Good. And, well, sure, they should, and maybe we can get uh, get them both out of there. Uh, well, see, so you get them both out of there. Now you get Ryan, and Ryan's the I worst know. of the three. Ryan, Ryan, so Ryan. I know. But, yeah, but I'll Ryan tell you something. Is, something. Well, I won't say he's the worst of the three. He, I think he's better than Pence. No, I don't. Uh, Ryan is a I don't. But Ryan one other thing, smug, I saw something. Smug, I saw something smug, last week. He's a smug. I saw punk. something that I saw last week was that Ryan is also involved in whatever is going on in Russia. You know, one of the oh. reasons Ryan, one of the reasons Ryan is so, you know, uh, praises Trump to the moon. One of his big praisers, from what I've read, and and again, I don't know if this is false news or whether it's true. Is that when they're you know funneling all this money uh, through this Russian bank? Somehow Ryan was involved in that. So we have if to see. that be the case. If they could bring yeah. him into it, that's yeah. the trifecta I've been looking for. And well, that's, Scalise, that's right. it turn, and Scalise, it, it turns out, and I certainly, it's a horrible way to um, handle it. Oh, you know, it's violence. But right. You know what? Um, right. He would have been the next guy. Uh, no, he may not have been the next guy, but he's a big. Uh, he's as bad as as any of them. And um, uh, I'm still waiting. So, I'm still waiting for a call from these people to reduce the gun violence by getting rid of the automatic rifles, getting rid of the war guns, getting rid of the ammunition, forget not it. letting it into the hands of crazy people. If they I'm waiting for the Republican. Thing after uh, Newtown in Connecticut uh, four years, four and a half years ago, they're not going to do anything with this. Yeah, but those were just kids, and they weren't their kids. This was one of them who actually got shot. Gonna, so uh, I'm wondering now that somebody has taken a military rifle after one of them, maybe they'll figure out that the idea is to have background checks to keep these guns out of the hands of the crazy people. Scalise, Scalise has an A-plus rating from the NRA. I have no doubt. And Bernie has yeah. a good rating from the NRA, which means, which tells me that the whole system is skewed. The whole lobbyist system of uh, the NRA got Bernie elected in 1990 to Congress. Originally, he's indebted to them for the rest of his life. Um, they're talking about changing rules now. Get this. If you qualify to have a gun in one state, you can take that gun to New York, there, um, for instance, where there's um, no gun control. I was reading about that, that that's what these cuckoos are, sure. are trying to it's do. Why we I would need, like it's to why yeah, the Democrats need a president from either New York or California. That's what they need to get out of the get out from under the the aegis of the NRA. Right. Um, so back to Steinbrenner. But, yeah. Okay. I just want to say the Democrats are so close to being re Republicans. Trump is a hybrid. He's not what the Republicans want. They didn't in some way be happy to get him out. Scares me, though. What if he's out, the next president pardons him right off the bat, and boom. Um, yeah, well, so what? Well, who cares? Well, what yeah, do you care? But, so what? 
That's true. He's gone. They, they, they pardoned yeah. Nixon. So what? Who cares? You know, so what? Yeah. I don't know. So hopefully this will drag on for the next year, and we'll see what happens. At any rate, so well, Steinbrenner. Maybe, maybe because they pardon Nixon, what we have today could be a result of that. There, that started the absolute corruptness in the the presidency that um, led us to Cheney, led us to you know the Bush Cheney thing. So I don't know if, if pardoning. Uh, Nixon was such a good idea. But let's talk baseball. Let's talk Steinbrenner. If you would, Are we his on? relationship did you with... This? Did you start this, Ralph? Pardon me? Did you start the uh, recording? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> God. Did, did you, I did say we are back uh, and all that. that. Thank God you scared me there for a second, Al. I've been known to do stupider things with technology. But, um, yes. Um, Steinbrenner, Steinbrenner grew up outside of Cleveland, to the, the west, west of Cleveland in a small town. His father owned a shipping company. Uh, his, his, his father's shipping company shipped cereals, Kellogg cereals. It shipped steel across the Great Lakes. It was called Kinsman Marine was the name of it. And he was a fairly, you know, fairly wealthy guy, uh, did very well. The father, though, was a real taskmaster. The father was very, very difficult to work for. You made a mistake, you were going to get fired. And, and George, after going to uh, military high school, and then he went to Williams College, and interestingly enough, what George really wanted to do, what he really wanted to do was to become a college football coach. So after college, uh, he went to, he joined the Air Force, uh, where he was on a, he was working in a base in Columbus, Ohio, where they made him the athletic director of the base, interestingly enough. And uh, he was involved with athletics. Uh, he coached basketball, he coached football, he coached baseball. He actually took a team to Japan where they accused him of, of getting ringers, putting ringers on the baseball team. Uh, he, he also coached the local high school football team, helped coach, you know, volunteered coach. Um, he found a kid who was a, a fairly good runner and sort of adopted that kid, uh, trained him. Till he became the state, uh, uh, I think, 100-yard dash champion in the state of Ohio. Um, you know, he, 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 he found a woman who he fell in love with, and he married her there in, 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 in Columbus. And, and after the Air Force, he went and he was football coach at a couple of schools at Northwestern. Uh, he was there for a year as an ends coach, and then he went to Purdue. Uh, the great uh, Purdue quarterback, uh, Lenny, tell me Lenny's last name. Um, Dawson. Uh, I mean, Lenny, Dawson. Uh, Dawson. Lenny Dawson. Lenny Dawson was, uh, was the quarterback there. And I actually interviewed Lenny about George and said George was a very fine man and a very fine coach. I interviewed a couple of the ends who also said great things about him, what a great coach he was going to be. And at the end of the two years coaching college football, his father called him up on the phone and said, you either come back and work for me and Kinsman Marine, or I'm going to disinherit you, or you can forget it. You know, you're on your own. And it sort of broke the kid's heart in a way, because really what he wanted to be was a football coach. But he came home to Cleveland, and he went to work for his father at Kinsman Marine. He was one of the, the top people in the company. And while he was living in Cleveland, he started, uh, he, he bought a basketball team in, in, in the ABA, uh, the Pipers, the Cleveland yeah, Pipers. Basketball league. It was not right? the ABA. The ABA yeah, well, was several years later. It was two different, it was two different leagues. It, it, yeah, the, it, he was in the ABL. A, ABL, that's what it was. Yeah. The ABL. It was the ABL, that, and, that and he almost. Because when I was in, at Pitt, uh, Pittsburgh, I had a team in that league. Oh, isn't that great? Yeah, Pittsburgh had, had a year and a half. Yes, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh had uh, the great 
the great player who was banned from Connie the, Hawkins. Yeah. Yes, he had Connie Hawkins was in Pittsburgh. At any rate, George took this team almost to the NBA. He had to raise two hundred fifty thousand dollars. If he had raised it, he would have gone into the NBA. He signed. He signed up Jerry Lucas. Yeah, that's how far he got. He signed up Jerry Lucas to play on his team, and he wrote these wrote them a check, and of course the check bounced, and that that sort of stopped that. Uh, but but more than anything, when when the father died, uh, he he inherited the company and a hell of a lot of money, um, and. Um, you know, he had, a, you know, a fairly bad reputation for the way he handled his employees. Uh, well, how, tell the story of how he bought the team in the first place. Well, or, uh, the, the Yankees came up for sale in 1972, and he went to Mike Burke. Mike Burke uh, was with CBS. CBS owned it, and Burke wanted to buy it, and CBS said, we don't want it anymore. You're more than welcome uh, to buy it, and Burke didn't have any money, and so he got the money from Steinbrenner and all of Steinbrenner's Cleveland friends, and the entire team, the New York Yankee team, was sold for $10 million, which is less than what we're paying A-Rod this year, which is which is amazing. Yes. And it was funny, because I was, I was with the Yankees. Um, in the fall of 1972, when I was doing my research for my very first book, Dynasty, when George Steinbrenner bought the team. And I could tell immediately the chaos that occurred with the purchase of the team by Steinbrenner and Mike Burke. Mike Burke was a lovely, lovely, lovely man. He was, uh, he was into the arts. He was into music. Uh, poetry, uh, a, a very, you know, wonderful guy. Um, uh, people people like poets would be throwing out the first ball at Yankee games. And immediately Steinbrenner's response was, what are these goddamn poets throwing out the first ball at Yankee games? They get, get rid of all, all of these people. Let's get rid of all of Mike Burke's friends. And basically Steinbrenner, within two months, made things so uncomfortable and difficult for Burke uh, that Burke decided, I don't need this. And he sold his share to Steinbrenner, and he moved to Ireland, leaving Whoa. the Yankees in the hands of George Steinbrenner. And, of course, you know, that, that cuts two ways. The Yankees hadn't won since 1964, and this was now 1973. And immediately Steinbrenner uh, started spending money. You know, he got he got Catfish Hunter when Charlie Finley stupidly, you know, broke the contract that the two of them had signed. Uh, when right. free agency came into being, he signed Reggie Jackson for a couple of million dollars, which was at the time all the money in the world. And the Yankees, of course, you know, won in 1975, 1976, no, no, 1976, 77, 78, and 81 under Steinbrenner for the very first time under Billy Martin and ten other managers, um, but that you know that was that was George's doing. Even though the team was put together by Gabe Paul during the two years that George Steinbrenner was suspended from baseball for giving money illegally to um, Richard Nixon and the committee to reelect the president. So right. that was suspension number one. Suspension number one, but but it was so interesting to be a part of the Yankees during those several months when George took over because That's one what by I want to one. Ask you about. What was your first meeting? Your first how you doing with him? I only had one how you doing with him, and that's while I was writing the book. Uh, I had already written the Billy Martin book, which which excoriated him. Um, but I asked for a meeting, and he, he gave it to me, and he gave me a very, very uh, decent interview. And at the same, same time, he said, I know, I know that all of the information that was in the Billy Martin book, uh, that you didn't make any of that, because I know that you must have had it on tape. And I told him I did. Um, you know, he, he said, in this book, you better watch out. Make sure you don't get sued, <laughs> meaning get sued by him. You know, he had, like I said, he and Trump had very similar, uh, similar kind of notions of how you, 
uh, you know, strong arm people. Oh yeah, uh, um, boy, and their boy. effects, uh, their dad's oh. effects on yeah. the respective dad's re- effect on them are so similar because you yeah. could see human beings responding as kids, uh, torn between hating your father and wanting to please your father. Um, well, that's that's wow. the nature of abuse. I mean, that that is the nature of abuse. You know, when you're abused as a child and called all sorts of rotten names and told how, you know, how you just don't measure up, um, you know, a lot of things happen, including, you know, trying to, you know, to, to, in your own eyes, trying to be as important as you possibly can. And at the same time, abusers always tend to abuse others who are under them. You know, I've always been told that a person is, uh, you can tell the character of the person by how he treats the little people. And, right. you know, you take take Steinbrenner, uh, he fired some secretary because uh, she, she brought him a tuna fish sandwich and he wanted some other kind of sandwich. And, of course, you know, you got Trump who, you know, not only fires people, but, you know, doesn't pay them and sues them and, and just, you know, treats everybody in the worst, worst possible way. Well, uh, but... One of the great lines of, uh, about George Steinbrenner was by uh, John McMullen, who was a limited partner uh, with, the, with Steinbrenner and the Yankees before he bought the Astros. Right. And he said that there's nothing more limited than being a limited partner of George Steinbrenner. And, and that's absolutely true. That was absolutely true. Um, and yet, and in a very brilliant way, from what I understand, Steinbrenner bought the Yankees for $10 million dollars and I don't think he put down a million dollars at the time they bought the thing, and yet the contract was such that the only person who had any say whatsoever was him. And and slowly, as the Yankees started to make money, he would take that money and buy the shares from all of his, all of his other shareholders until the point where he owned the entire team. And at the point where he where he died, uh, he owned it all and passed it on to his two sons. And the other fortunate thing that happened was that he died during the one year when there was a one-year hiatus in the death tax. Yeah. Oh. So, so, so ordinarily, he probably would have had to sell the team. They would have probably had to sell the team uh, because the, the inheritance tax would have been uh, too high, you know, for him to maintain it. Uh, but that year... The Republicans had, you know, uh, put the inheritance tax in a one-year abeyance, and so Steinbrenner's sons and daughter uh, could, you know, inherit the team without any loss whatsoever uh, in taxes. Right. Uh, there are also other ways of avoiding taxes that these rich guys pass on. They put their money in trusts. They buy houses and stuff, and they have. Uh, the trust doesn't pay any taxes on the income. It, the rich get really richer, and we're in um, – that's part of our dilemma as a country. We're being yeah, ruled by they, folks or represented by millionaires, and they, uh, most of us are not millionaires. And the House of Representatives has like 123 millionaires. Well, that, that, that's alone. what happens – that's what happens when your goal in getting elected is to make as much money as you can from the lobbyists who are paying you all this money uh, to do things uh, like, you know, bringing back coal, uh, like doing exactly what the Koch brothers want, like pretending that global warming doesn't exist. Um, I mean, the only thing that they have not been able to do so far, you know, after – uh, Trump made the Secretary of State, the former president of Exxon, this guy Tillerson, the deal was that they were going to go into Russia and remove the sanctions from the Russians so that Tillerson and Exxon Mobil could drill for oil in hundreds of thousands of acres of land that they had had uh, reserved uh, for Exxon Mobil. Uh, the problem was, is that uh, it became so obvious to everybody that Trump was in Russia's pocket uh, that they have not been able to do that. Well, uh, there are checks and balances along the way. 
I'm going to ask you guys if you know. I was going to look this up a while back. Does Trump have the codes to the nuclear thing? Absolutely. Uh, he go, yeah. I know that. He does. Absolutely, he does. Sure. Okay. Sure, he does. So he could wake up like he does in the middle of the night, grumpy, and instead of tweeting, he could push a button. Am I correct? That's eh, not going to happen. I, I wouldn't get that all bent out of shape. Well, if he seems to be from one all of those people, fans, all those religious, all those religious oh, jackpots who believe in the uh, Armageddon, yeah. When it comes that, when it all comes down on him, and he could be indicted for uh, um, obstruction of justice, yeah, and that's potential prison time. Guys like that. No, you can't. You can't imprison a president for obstruction of justice. They just slap his wrist. Come on. I. They're not, uh, they're not doing. I don't now, know. If they if they follow the money and find out somehow that that he's been conspiring with the Russians, that's probably impeachable. Uh, or but not, he's but making, you're not you're making, you're not throwing money a sitting from, president uh, in jail. Making money money from uh, foreign countries as president. That's a yeah, you're not I supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah, you're not. Right. All right, so don't volume, you won't volume name it clause. obstruction yeah. of justice. You'll throw obstruction of justice in with the 80 other counts, perhaps. Well, we'll see. Well, we will see. But, but throwing, throw, you don't throw a sitting president in jail. The only thing you can do is impeach him and throw him out. And you've no, got I a hell of a well, lot of Republicans. A it, hell of a lot of Republicans. Happen. Yeah, not going to happen. Telling you right now. <laughs> well, um, well, what? We could so hope. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I, I was hoping, I'm still hoping that Cheney and Bush are indicted for war crimes. Yeah. Well, for Christ's sake, and that's, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen either, yeah. right? But uh, what is going to happen? We're going to enjoy the rest of the evening. Uh, it's Father's Day. I'm going to yep. put this up later on, and. Okay. Uh, I thank you, gentlemen, for sharing uh, your time with me this evening. As, uh, Always a pleasure, Ralphie boy. Always a pleasure. That's a, that's thank that's you, Norm. Have a great week. <laughs> Quote <laughs> the great, <laughs> great Ralph Meyer, who actually said this, says, I want to wish all you fathers a happy birthday. There you go. Absolutely. He actually said this on a telecast. He did. Yeah. He did. Uh, yeah. Ralph Kiner, right. One of the the old Joe Pignatano line, um, happy birthday, Happy Father's Day to all you mothers. <laughs> <laughs> so let's leave it at that. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Alan, Peter, ah, see you soon. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Hey, thank you again.